our student speaker, Kimberly Hollins. Ooh, no pressure. Um, well, here we are, class of 2018. As a hip hop artist, Chaldo Gambino states, this is America, but it's now millennial America. Oh, I'm gonna go into this, but I'm gonna get real with this. Years ago, I dropped out of high school. I got my GED. I returned years later to get my BA, and today, my master's degree. You see, I'm fascinated with the learning process. Holistically, people learn through relationships. Our relationship with ourselves, the environment, nature, people. Academically, we learn through belief-based relationships. For people of color, it has the power to trigger us to perform really well. And when a professor believes in our potential, we begin to feel included in our education system. And then some of us, we become change agents and sign up to change the system. When we control the dialogue of our belief systems, lasting transformation happens. You see, as Alice Walker once said, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. So here is my open letter for Millennial America, class of 2018. Computer science majors, one of you use Python or Ruby on Rails to code for social justice change? In the era of AI technology, Amazon has their coders building facial recognition software to track down criminals. We need coders to build AI technologies that transform social justice agencies and build racial equity across borders, sexual identities, genders, so-called races, socioeconomic backgrounds, and social status. Does Amazon's Alexa and Microsoft's Cortana do anything economically and equitably transformational for our government system? Probably not. But it can provide us with ideas on how to use natural language processing to improve data science collection for diversity initiatives and perhaps helps us find a replacement for the bell curve in the US education system. To all the global studies, economic information systems, and business majors, how will you use your new knowledge and skills to improve not only your annual income, but to challenge yourself to learn and perhaps advocate for an equitable global GDP? That's a gross domestic product among African nations that actually own all the rich mineral and oil resources that America depends on for their wealth and stability. And to those who will be walking away with a doctorate today, did you learn how you learn? Maybe one day you can visit classrooms in Finland to observe how student autonomy and collaborative teaching has strengthened the mindset of learners. Or visit classrooms in Ghana, where technology is still developing, but the academic rigor, intellectual discourse surpasses expectations in many US classrooms. I share this with you only to remind you that education beyond US borders will challenge you to do more and to think more creatively about how to shape our millennial America. In closing, to every student representing the class of 2018 today. You see, your degree is not just about taking to Amazon, Microsoft, Boeing, or to serve some of the best research institutions here in Seattle or beyond. It's a representation how you decide to use your education to assist in racial and educational equity beyond the classroom. So here's to you, Millennial America, an inclusive and ever-evolving America. Wakanda, Madase, thank you. Greetings, class of 2018. It's such an honor for me to be able to speak at the commencement at my beloved Northeastern University. Thank you, Dean Paula and Director Yin, for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'm going to tell two stories of my life. Hopefully, they can inspire you as you start your journey after graduation. My first story is about embracing failures, and I have had many. The biggest failure I encountered early in my life was the college entrance exam. I'm sure most of you are not familiar with this, but in China, 
all your high school years uh, to, uh, to prepare you for this exam. You work like crazy for three years, and the colleges will judge you solely on the score of this single exam. That's it. To make matters worse, you are essentially only applying to one college. In theory, you could choose a second college, but it would be held against you, and then they will deduct lots of points from your score. I guess no one in China wants to be the second choice. Adding to that problem, I was an overly confident high school kid. I thought I was smart enough and didn't need to work hard to prepare. But surprise, surprise, my score wasn't high enough for my first choice college. And with the deduction of points my second choice college would give, I didn't hold out a lot of hope there either. So for the whole month, I was waiting for the results. I woke up every morning and prayed I would be accepted by any college. That was a tough month. But in hindsight, it was the best gift I've ever received. It made me realize I cannot take anything for granted. If I had put all my effort into that exam, none of this would have happened. Anyhow, I guess praying worked <laughs> because my second choice college was gracious enough to take me. I cannot tell you how grateful I was and I was determined to make the most of it. So when my friends were playing computer games, I was reading books in the library. When they were out dating girls or having fun, <laughs> I was working on projects or studying for exams. If I had not lived through that month, I would never have spent so much time and effort in my college, and I would have just cruised through it. The good foundation I built in college was crucial for my graduate study and career. That so-called failed exam was really a blessing in disguise. So embrace failures. They are really opportunities. My second story is about appreciating the help you get and paying it forward. After college, I was fortunate enough to get into the PhD program here at Northeastern University. Adding to my good fortune, I had Dr. Raja Raman as my advisor. He was the best advisor I could hope for. Not only did he help me grow academically, but also he cared about me personally. He encouraged me to take advantage of internships, which helped me make a lot of friends and pro professional connections. Later, he offered me an opportunity to teach the algorithm class, so where I realized uh, being able to share what I learn is extremely rewarding, especially when I see students actually enjoying algorithm class. However, what really impressed me most was Dr. Raj cared a lot, me, a lot about me personally. One time I got into a car accident. I was fine, but the car was totaled. When Dr. Raj learned about this, he came to me and asked me if everything was all right and told me if I needed any financial help, just let him know. Well, <laughs> I managed to cover the costs, but just the fact he cared about my well-being meant so much to me. This is just one of the million things Dr. Raj did for me outside his advising responsibility. His kindness throughout the years made him more than just a great advisor. Dr. Raj inspired me to also be a good mentor and make a difference for others. Well, I know I can never be an amazing advisor like Dr. Raj, but I can still make impact by doing small things, like helping students prepare the interviews, connecting them to different teams at Google, and showing compassion for students having a difficult time. Even though these are not directly related to my work at Google, but the sense of fulfillment I receive energizes the work I, I do every day. So I encourage you to also help others, even if you think it is something very small. I'm sure Dr. Raj has no idea that how the impact his kindness would have on me, and 10 years later, I will still remember it, like so much so I'm here today telling you about it. A new chapter of your life is just starting today. As you know, things may not always work out the way you planned, 
but there, there are always opportunities to learn and grow in any situation. And then throughout your career, you will find people like Dr. Raj who help you success. And in return, you can do the same for someone else. Finally, congratulations to you, class of 2018. I hope you all accomplished your goals here, and I'm confident Northeastern has prepared you well for your career after graduation. I wish you all my best. Thank you. So first off, congratulations, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today on your special day, on the first day of the rest of your life, a day where you feel like you can conquer anything the world throws at you. For most of you, you're thinking, what's next? For some of you, what's now? Um, but you're thinking, what, you know, what career are you going to pursue? What idea are you going to pursue? How are you going to leverage this master's degree um, to, uh, to advance and enhance your life? So today, while you're thinking of how you're going to learn or how you're going to use what you learned here today to enhance your life, I would also like you to consider how you're going to use it to enhance the lives of others. So yes, I'm talking about others that are your friends and family. Shout out to the fan club here on both sides of you. Um, but I'm also talking about others who do not think like you, others who do not look like you, others who are not from the same world you're from, and others who may have needs, needs that you don't understand yet. So I'm not talking about you know, just to help them or to give them charity. I'm talking about partnering with them. I'm talking about combining your knowledge and your experience with their knowledge and experience and creating something that will impact the community that you share. So I work for the world's largest dedicated peace building organization and conflict resolution organization called Search for Common Ground. Search, hang on, I almost lost it, but I caught it. I could feel it sliding. So Search is the world's Largest dedicated peace organization, I already said that, but we're also nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize this year. So before you, know, before you get the wrong idea about us and you envision you know, hippies in the forest singing Kumbaya together, let me just set you straight. Um, we have offices in 35 countries all over the world. 90% of our staff is actually local to the areas that they work in. And they are the most courageous, the most compassionate, and the most practical individuals you'll ever meet. So we do everything from uh, countering violent extremism, reconciliation after genocide, prevention of mass atrocity work, gender equality, security sector reform, refugee integration, and as was mentioned before, I do social change communication training. So collaborating with our local staff and our local partners, um, making sure that they're empowered to create as effective messages and campaigns as possible. As also mentioned, I'm also the co-creator of Battle for Humanity, um, a, game, a mobile game designed to forge real life heroes. So the app's in the store, so all of you are welcome to help me beta test it. Uh, but how it works is users choose missions and actions to take in real life to help them fight violence, hate, and injustice, and give them the tools to make positive, constructive change in their community. So what we're doing is we're gamifying common ground activism, which is basically um, using collaboration and problem solving to build positive social change in our communities instead of aggressive or possibly destructive means. You see, we believe that our inability to deal with difference stops us from making progress on every single issue facing mankind today. So I am here sharing this with you today because I want you to make progress. I want you to make progress in your careers. I want you to make progress in your life. And I want you to make progress in your community. Common ground activism is so useful because, guess what? Tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, you are going to face conflict. You are going to face people 
and situations and ideologies that you do not agree with. So, common ground activism. I think it's best described using a dragon metaphor, because uh, let's face it, everything's better with dragons. So, imagine this. Imagine that you're trapped in a deep, dark pit and you're facing a dragon. The world will tell you that you have two choices. You either slay the dragon or you be eaten by the dragon, right? Be killed or kill or be killed. So we're the fairy godmothers with the dragon treats in the saddle because we don't want you just to survive. We want you to fly. We want you to thrive. We want to be a society of high functioning dragon riders. So all of our lives we're taught that someone has to lose in order for us to win, right? But what if we shifted our objective from make them, whoever they are, lose to instead, I'm gonna one, make them an ally. Two, I'm gonna prevent or stop harm. And three, I'm gonna solve a problem. It would definitely change the way that we talk to and treat each other. If I call someone a racist, I might get my point across. But are they any closer to wanting to understand me or wanting to help me? It's doubtful. So, actually this is our first step of our approach for Battle for Humanity, is our first step is to strategize. So, to set your objective, what are you trying to accomplish? Our second step is armor up. So, this means you choose how things affect you and you choose how you respond in a situation. So we don't ask you to change your beliefs, your identity, we ask you to change how you respond to a situation. So you are not a blade of grass caught in a whirlwind of predetermined reactions. No, you hold the power to choose how you respond. Will that response always be accepted and respected? I wouldn't go that far but it shouldn't stop us from making the right choice. Okay, so strategize, armor up, and our third step is aim true. So attack the problem, not the person. It's so easy. Okay, it's not easy, but it's so simple. Attack the problem, not the person. Keep your eye on the prize. So focus on what's on our shared value and your shared interests with your opponent not your separate positions, and you may need to reassess and reload. Because if I've learned anything in working in this line of business, it's peace is a process. So speaking of uh, peace process, as mentioned, I arrived yesterday um, from Colombia, and in Colombia I was working with young leaders um, around social change communication stuff. And some of them are privileged, some of them are not, but they were all dedicated to making their community and their country better. Uh, after a you know, vicious conflict that's lasted over 50 years and in almost impossible odds, during a time of deep division, they spent their time and their resources, big or small, in order to make people's lives around them better. So today, we're also facing great division in our communities and our countries and it's happening in countries all over all over all over the world and we have a choice it's so easy right now to lash out to blame to accuse um, it's also easy to ignore right to put our head down and to focus on what we can control our future hopefully but to, to try to block out everything else that could distract us or, or hold us down. So on this day, on a day of hope, on a day of anticipation, on a day of what's next, I encourage you to take a third path, a path where you strategize, where you armor up, and you wage and you aim true. Because even though it might be an uphill path, not many have taken it, it is so worth it. Because where others see obstacles, you will see opportunities. Where others see enemies, you will see your next ally. And where others see difference, you will see a pathway to innovation. 
Your ideas will take flight. I want you to envision this moment for a second. Your ideas will take flight because who would not want to hire, promote, or work for someone who is like that? And if you add, if you apply that mindset to the human suffering that you see around you, we might all have a fighting chance at overcoming humanity's greatest challenges. So on that note, fly high, my friends, fly high. Master of Science in Computer Science, David Agumia. <laughs> Xiao Ai. Chloe Anastasiedis. <laughs> Mark Bonacio. <laughs> Yoganand Chandasagar. Tushar Chaturvedi. Wen Chen. Shayao Dong. <laughs> Susanna Edens. <laughs> Brittany Blue Gaston. Crystal Gomes. <laughs> Danny Lee. <laughs> Mark Gruby. Donshu Han. <laughs> Muyang He. <laughs> Will Hembry. Minhal Hu. <laughs> Haurang Hong. <laughs> uh, 
Amala Joshi. Akshay Kulkarni. Todd Lamb. Sunju Lee. Baohang Lee. Lu Liu. Melody Love. Yan Luau. Chien Li Ma. V. Wen. <laughs> Wen Chin. <laughs> Naish Ren. Prachi Sharma. <laughs> she went song. <laughs> Rinal Sarov. Rahul Thomas. Woo! Alicia Trubchek. Meha Verma. Tina Vivio. <laughs> Chu Chi Wang. <laughs> you don't Wang. You won. <laughs> Ji Chang Shu. <laughs> Li Yang.
Ravi Teja Yalamanchari. Chi Zhang. And with the College of Engineering, with the Masters of Science in Information Systems, Anshu Chutani. <laughs> Pang Chang Jo. Neha Gupta. Sang Sang Ho. Siong Mi Kong. Ni Li Ji <laughs> Yuan Li <laughs> Yang Li Jinja Leo Chifei Lu Sida Nu Chung and Pai Ken Putera Prayogo Sana Sharif. Sean Sun Baratian Wang Chao Ju Shu Jiquan Shu Chi Chu Zhao
with the College of Professional Studies, Master of Education, Kimberly Hollins. Master of Science in Commerce and Economic De Development, Shinten Huang. <laughs> Yu Chang Lin. Master of Science in Global Studies and International Relations, Zuri Green. <laughs> Angela Shelley. With a Master of Science in Nonprofit Management, Ivory Rhodes. Master of Science in Project Management, Carlina Antono. <laughs> Harold Caraviv Castro. Ife Chen. <laughs> Supriya Gorthy. Donna Kuchmashova Fernandez. <laughs> Shin Lee. Tai Lee Jiaming <laughs> Ma Monisha Mirun Krishnan. Adaris Milan. Michael Nzazi.
Gitanjali Ramesh. Sihan Sun. Yoon Tian. Akshita Tiagi. Jing Zhao. Tianyi Zhao. Master of Science in Regulatory Affairs for Drugs, Biologics, and Medical Devices, Nia Lu. With the College of Science, Master of Science in Bioinformatics, Sarah Altamimi. Aliska, Alyssa, Ilescopitas. <laughs> With the Demore McKim School of Business, Master of Business Administration, Seiko Eaton. It's now my very great pleasure to recognize the graduates here today who are receiving Doctor of Education degrees. Our EDD graduates know how much effort has gone into their degree. You know that it's been not a sprint, but a marathon appropriately today. And so does everyone else here know that it's been a marathon and not a sprint. Um, and I mean, especially your families and friends, family members and friends. For those of us here today who didn't have the opportunity, at least not this year, to support a Northeastern University doctoral candidate, let me say a few words about the doctoral degree and about the symbolism of hooding that we attach to it at graduation. The EDD, according to the Carnegie Project on the Education Doctorate, prepares educators for the application of appropriate and specific practices, the generation of new knowledge, and the stewardship of the profession. The centerpiece of the EDD is the dissertation research undertaken by the doctoral candidate under the direction of a faculty member. This relationship is demanding on both sides, as you heard earlier today from Dr. Sun. There's a reason that fewer than 3% of Americans hold a doctoral degree. Our EDD students are already full-time professionals and leaders in their fields. In true Northeastern fashion, they are researching what they live and living what they research every day with the goal of improving learning wherever it occurs, whether in K-12 education, in colleges and universities, in the workplace, or in community organizations. Their faculty directors are the accomplished scholar practitioners that our doctoral students aspire to be. Dissertation directors invest themselves in the success of their students through hours and hours of mentorship and through hundreds of pages of chapter drafts ahead of the final dissertation defense. So, this demanding relationship comes with its own symbolism. At graduation, doctoral students traditionally have the hoods of their academic regalia placed over their heads by the faculty. Our doctoral candidates will bend their knees a little bit and our faculty members will stretch a little bit taller, whatever we need to do in order to meet our learners where they are. 
The symbolism of Hooding embodies both humility and pride on both sides of the relationship as faculty members welcome a new peer into their community. As we turn to Hood, our doctoral students, let me say on behalf of Northeastern's Boston-based faculty that we are humbled and proud to welcome all of you into Northeastern's alumni family today. Congratulations on this very special day. Doctor of Education, Christy Brown. Cynthia Davis Van Lu. Sylvester Gaskin. That's right. We did this. That's right. Darlene Kelly. Congratulations to all of our graduates. So as we part today, I really don't feel inclined to say goodbye, good luck, but rather welcome home. Congratulations.